Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Legal 500s webinar on current venture capital trends in the Czech Republic. Koshan uh, Sok uh, Balasik is a leading Czech uh, independent law firm with a high profile in the Czech market for over 30 years. It has a strong history of involvement in novel transactions, pioneering the use of new structures in Czech law. The speakers from KSB today are Ota Mach and Josef Kritz, both of whom are from KSB's younger generation of associates that continue the firm's work in groundbreaking transactions. Three years ago, they established a venture capital legal advisory desk within KSB. Previously, they were specializing in M&A, corporate and financing, so they came into VC uh, as advisors with extensive experience, relevant skills, and legal knowledge. Venture capital investments are relatively new and not so widespread phenomenon in the Czech Republic. So there are a few market standards, specialized firms, or recognized individuals when compared to standard practice areas of banking, finance, or m &A. But the situation is currently changing and Ota and Josef are part of the new VC legal advisory wave. They actively participate in an association of several legal firms uh, preparing model investment agreements for startups, publish legal articles on several topics relevant for VC investments, and hold lectures regarding legal aspects of venture capital investment. Ota and Josef will be accompanied to, in today's discussion by Angelo uh, Borrello, uh, Business Development Director from AI Startup Incubator, an investment fund that focuses on early stage AI startups. Angelo is one of the uh, partners at AI Startup Incubator and ASI's newly built ventures fund, SICAV, called uh, Look AI Ventures. Angelo is also one of the partners of the biggest online media outlet for foreigners living in the Czech Republic, Prague Morning, and a private investor in multiple uh, European startups. In his career, Angelo has been involved in various managerial positions covering business development, project development, uh, management, and implementation planning for IT solutions. Angelo's key competencies revolve around assisting founders in establishing their businesses and, when necessary, raising capital to enable growth. At AISI and Look AI Ventures, Angelo is responsible for starting a potential identification during AISI startup evaluation processes and investment contract negotiations. Lastly, this webinar will be moderated by Sasha Stepanova an English qualified solicitor at KSB uh, who heads the English law desk and has extensive experience representing international clients. Before we begin, I do wanna note that you will see like below a Q and A button. So please, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q and A. The speakers will then answer them at the end of the webinar. So handing it over to Sasha, thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much, Nathan. We're very excited to be with our audience today because venture capital is really a very hot area in the Czech Republic these days. And I'd like to kick off our discussion by turning to Angelo. Um, Angelo, in order to set the scene for our audience, it might be interesting to hear what attracted you as a venture capital investor to come to the Czech Republic. And could you perhaps just very briefly describe one or two recent VC deals that you've done here? Uh, thanks for the question, Sasha, and uh, thanks to Kaisba for having me today. It's a pleasure to have uh, this panel discussion with you guys. So long story short, uh, when I decided to move to Czech Republic, uh, the main reason was the economic landscape. I saw in Czech Republic a perfect place full of opportunities, which is still <coughs> has a lot of space for growth, and I find myself uh, being able to navigate within the initial difficulties with the language and, uh, and the unknown of the traditions and everything that, uh, of course, a foreigner or expats does experience when moving to a new country. But I was fascinated by many of those aspects and uh, I quickly fell in love with the Czech culture and uh, the Czech language, mm -hmm. language itself, uh, which found myself like starting some projects on my own working as a consult consultant for different firms, uh, including startups, getting to understand a little bit the landscape of the startups in the Czech Republic and in the Central Eastern Europe, and finally joining the AI Startup Incubator as one of the uh, partners, 
uh, in a specific focus, which is artificial intelligence, which I strongly believe is going to be one of the main pillars of the a new technology revolution that is already happening, but that will play even a more crucial role in the future. Uh, Czech Republic is practically one of the leading countries in the Central Eastern European uh, Union in terms of innovation. And uh, um, with this luggage of great technically skilled people, is actually uh, well positioned to, to make a disruption in this specific sector. So that's, that's quickly about the reason why. Yeah, and we can confirm that Angela is speaking brilliantly Czech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, th thank you, Angelo. That's that's very interesting. Um, following on from that, I'd like to ask you, Angelo, how do you perceive the current mood on the Czech venture capital market? Uh, in the past couple of years, we, we've had some quite large scale disruptive events. I'm thinking about COVID, the war in Ukraine. Uh, now we have very high inflation. How have all these things uh, affected the, the current mood for venture capital in the Czech Republic? So the fact that there is a crisis going on, uh, it's a fact. Um, that it does affect uh, venture capital deals at a certain level, it's a fact too. Because uh, what that's created, it's a drop of valuation in those later stage startups. Uh, so creating a little bit of issues for those startups that were um, hyper valuated and uh, there was a little bit of speculation in pumping up the, the valuation of the startups. Overall, this is not a, just a Czech Republic thing, but an overall trend. In the early stage part of the venture capital though, uh, I think that the crisis opened many opportunities um, because uh, open space for investment firms to find very attractive deals uh, and probably in certain cases also with uh, a little bit better conditions, more um, fair conditions than the one that the bullish market was setting up before. Uh, so and this has created, in combination with the presence of cash in the market, uh, a great opportunity for investors. Uh, and uh, the, um, the fact that many uh, new venture capitals are actually uh, growing and being established in the Czech Republic at the moment. So in, um, there are cons, there are positive parts of it, like uh, in pretty much everything. And uh, I think that in the early stage space, there is a lot of uh, opportunities there are coming up at this moment. Yeah, well, just to react, uh, I can confirm I've been talking to many investors and what Angelo just said is that uh, the valuations were a bit, little bit decreased due to the recent events, uh, but it's not a necessarily bad thing, is it? It's, uh, as you said, if the market was too hot and basically, as I understand it, the valuations just are now getting more realistic. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes, I, I think that there was a little bit of a battle between uh, uh, the, the uh, financial rationale on the valuation uh, and uh, what was the perception of the potential valuation. Um, because uh, the, the major part of the deals done in early stage venture capital, specifically for artificial intelligence, but also for other sectors, uh, it's practically data in many cases. And the potential of data nowadays is very huge and very uh, unclear in certain cases in the sense that there is more potential than the founder itself can recognize. And this is, has, has been one of the factors that are contributed to increase in a sometimes speculative way the, the valuation of the companies. So now both companies and investors are coming back on the table of discussion, looking more at numbers, specifically uh, financials uh, from the beginning of the venture up until the exit, uh, making evaluation based on the financial projections and market uh, indicators uh, that are giving a more solid uh, fundament for uh, the startup valuation. Yeah, I think a sign of health market is uh, they are able to adapt to new realities. Yes. Maybe if we turn now to a, a legal perspective, um, Otto, can I ask you, as a lawyer, how do you see recent developments in venture capital in the Czech Republic? Yeah, thank, thank you, Sasha, for that uh, question, and very thank uh, to Nathan, thank to Nathan uh, for just such such a warm introduction. Uh, well, legal perspective. Okay, uh, numbers first. Uh, it's not a legal question, but numbers first. Uh, as I see venture capital market in the Czech Republic, uh, we, me and Josef, we have been, uh, or Josef and I, we have been looking at uh, numbers which are published. Josef, you will 
you you will cite yeah. the website. <laughs> uh, you can find on a website called founders.org. Uh, they are having a regularly updated spreadsheet called uh, fund, funding exits and failures in Czech VC capital. And I think it's updated very recently, like their last deals from October. And yeah, for anyone who is geek number, like me, you can go into the deeps of every every numbers there. But yeah, I, I think that you can describe what like a general mood in the market. Yeah, we will not go into too much detail, but just for you to get a better idea of what we are dealing here on the Czech market is, uh, well, the great the striking difference or the striking comparison is that the, the, the size of an average ticket of, of an investment in pre-seed and seed stage is nine times higher than it was 10 years ago. So that, that's really interesting. And what, for me, what's even more surprising is that it's seven times higher than five years ago. So we can see that the development or it's increasingly popular in the past couple of years. And that's where, when we jumped the train, me and Josef, uh, and put, where we were trying to, to develop ourselves as, uh, as, the, as the lawyers specialized in VC. Additionally, uh, the Czech market isn't a big market. Uh, the Czech Republic has 11 million right now. I don't know, but it's not a small market. Uh, I, I believe that in the Czech Republic, uh, we already have uh, 10, 10 or 11 funds, uh, which are doing 20 plus investment per year uh, with uh, average size over 1 million euros. So not a bad thing. So I would say that the Czech market, as Angelo rightly described, is uh, developing and it's developing fast. And uh, both the legal flame framework and the general and the position of the Czech Republic are uh, are helping hel helping to this and are welcoming to the investors, as Joseph will be discussing later on. Uh, back back to the legal perspective that you mentioned in the first place, Sasha. Uh, from my perspective or from my experience, what we, what we have been dealing with, uh, basically investors are in, are uh, investors invest. On the basis of two instruments, direct equity on convertible loans. Direct equity means that you uh, that you go to equity straight away. You just acquire a share in the company, and then and you are with them. So, uh, as Angelo was mentioning, valuations you need to determine the valuation in the beginning, and then uh, uh, and you take it from there. Convertible loan uh, agreements are really trendy. It's a modern product which enables you to postpone the moment. When you set the valuation of the startup uh, to a future event, for example, uh, for example, new investor coming to the company, so-called qualified investor, etc. So, what do you think, Angelo? Is that uh, what? What is your what is your preference if deciding which type of investment? The whole discussion is based on uh, on the fact that uh, we are now touching the early stage of maturity of the startups, and the early stage part of the evolution of the startup is a critical moment. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the, the team, the product may not be 100% uh, what it's going to look like in five years, because there could be a lot of evolution in terms of features, in terms of focus market. Sometimes startup may repeat adjust things a little bit. So it's bit, very difficult to um, create a comparable analysis with an existing company. Also because the disruptive nature of uh, the early stage startups um, is practically putting themselves in a bucket of companies. They are not 100% comparable with other existing in the market, which we can use for a comparison in order to understand what the evolution in terms of valuation could be, uh, which increase the difficulties of establishing this number, which is the valuation. Uh, so in this specific moment, there are actually two specific uh, uh, um, type of uh, agreements that are usually used are uh, the convertible loan agreement and the promise for future equity, which is the safe note that uh, Y Combinator in US has uh, created. And uh, those are used to skip this issue. So in simple terms, simple words, you not define the valuation today at an early stage of maturity, but you wait for the moment that the company is going to be ready uh, to, um, um, to have a fair market valuation that could be established among indicators and parameters from the market, or a qualified investment from a subsequent investment round, which ought to as uh, correctly defined as a subsequent investment round. Uh, so in, those, in this case, it's usually uh, fine and uh, 
widely spread the use of uh, the convertible loan agreement or a safe loan. Yeah, that's, that's actually an excellent point. Uh, just for our audience, uh, safe note or a simple agreement for which your future equity is uh, very similar to, to the convertible loan agreement, with the exception that in most cases you are not entitled to get your, invest get your investment back, but uh, the conversion into equity is, uh, is expected, is expected to happen. So it just that, that just for our own audience. And from our experience... From our experience, I think that it was natural that it all started with direct equity because there's a lot of history of MA in Czech Republic. So this was something we all knew that you are buying a share in the company directly. Uh, the only difference in VC world is that you are not buying 100% or you are not create joint venture buying 50%. You are buying, I don't know, three up to five, five percent. But uh, legally, it was like standard MA transaction only with a smaller stake. But uh, convertible instruments like convertible loan agreement, safe, and convertible notes, which are maybe used abroad, but not not much here, are Just the true- Just explain for our years again, convertible yeah. note and uh, safe, it's very uh, simple. Convertible note is a type of security uh, which to which in a right is incorporated to a conversion. And uh, as, Josef, as Josef indicated, we do have a regulation of, uh, of securities in the Czech Republic, and this is really not uh, what you would expect for a convertible note. So therefore we don't use convertible notes as securities, but uh, generally safe and uh, the CLA, the convertible loan agreement work on a contractual basis. So there is no, no security, uh, no security. It's, it has not, no form of securities. Sorry, yeah, yeah, for interrupting. And, and you, with respect to difference between safe and convertible loan agreements, uh, we now see that they are getting very uh, close together. And that's because in convertible loan agreements, we see a lot, mainly in German speaking countries, only in Switzerland, that uh, the startups are asking that the convertible loan, the obligation of the investor, is subordinated. Obligation of the company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the debt, yeah, basically yeah. the debt, yeah. The debt. And uh, we were asking why, and that is because in, in those countries there are very strict insolvency tests, like balance sheets. Uh, there are strictly balance sheet tests for insolvency. So when the book value of asset is lower than the book value of debt, you formally have to file an insolvency petition. Yeah, which can, which can trigger liability of the of the of the executive directors of the company. So that's in, why. In Czech Republic, we are looking more <coughs> into going conservative with the assets. So if the directors are able to reasonably explain that, okay, the book value of asset is low, but we are going to the roof and the going concern value of the asset is much higher than the debt, then this subordination is not uh, required. Yeah, it, and it's always low. The book value is always low because, well, once Angelo provides startup with, with money, they are burning cash every day. And the, 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 the cash is, is not going to be there in one or two or three months. So that's why you have to evaluate your product on a going concern basis. You have to look at the potential of the product, what it can have. And uh, if you are, as Josef correctly said, if you are able to justify uh, the value of the product, then you are not, uh, that you are uh, not obliged to file for insolvency or bankruptcy and you are good to go. So that's why you do not have to subordinate the convertible loans in, in the Czech Republic. So there when someone tries to try, tries to force you to subordinate the convertible loan, uh, tell them no. <laughs> and yeah, why we are saying this is because I don't see many differences between subordinated loan agreement and safe, because in both cases, you are simply not getting your money back as an investor. You only are getting equity. Yeah. If, if it's good. That's actually a good question because a uh, convertible loan agreement, not subordinated. Angelo, uh, have you ever experienced that it would be repaid instead of converted? No. no. <laughs> that's so, from my personal experience, yeah. I cannot talk about Yeah, that's also the different between like loan books and loan action because you don't expect as an investor to get your money back legally. Yes. Yeah, there you have a receiver, yes. they, they have a debt, but uh, nobody expected to pay, yeah. pay yeah. them back. And guys, if I may interject the conversation, I, I see an interesting point of discussion in uh, um, defining the two, two parts of the medals, right? Because there is the founder side, uh, which is looking to, in a certain way, reduce the liabilities that they have. Yeah? 
for the investment. And on the other end, there is a, a security uh, that the investor is looking for the investment is, make, is making. So the, the, the convertible loan agreement uh, coming with the loan is giving the security to the investor that uh, the loan itself you know, can be used as a tool yeah. at the end of the investment in case something got wrong with the contract. Because the investor at the end of the day is not looking for the money back. He's looking for the funders to build an asset. Yeah, it's a leverage, right? It's a, and, uh, and yes, and uh, it could be used as a leverage uh, the, because uh, things can get wrong and the investor not being part of the a, of the company board doesn't have any decision making power. Hmm. So at this point, they could see the investor could sit together with the founders and discuss what is going to happen afterwards. That doesn't have to be seen as a bad thing, but is the an empowerment for the investor to uh, have the uh, possibility to make decision with the board of founders about the evolution of the company when things go wrong. In any in any case, I believe that no investor. Uh, not in the Czech Republic or other countries looking for those money back you know, at the end of the day. Uh, the promise for future, uh, uh, then the, the safe note, uh, and practically the promise for future equity that it comes with, uh, is getting rid of the liability of the loan, but giving the investor the same conversion rights. Yes. So that no matter if it's a convertible loan or a, or a safe, the conversion will happen among specific terms. And what is getting rid of the equation is that is the loan itself. So the the the, the pressure that uh, can be brought to, to the founders when things go wrong. Yeah, I think you, you also mentioned that there are always two sides, like investor point yes. and the founder point. And I think that's also a thing that's changing recently, right? Also, <laughs> thank you. It brings me to the, it brings me uh, to this to this trend that we wanted to discuss actually. As Angelo mentioned in the beginning, uh, there is money in the market. There is money, and we are all looking for the projects to invest in. Uh, so, what we the trend that we have identified in recent years, uh, I don't know, five years ago, the position of investors was really strong. They could afford to ask for security, which would be uh, which would be unacceptable uh, today, because well, there are there are not that many eligible startups and they are really, as, as, as we mentioned, there are many investors or not many, but there are several investors in the Czech market ready to jump, uh, ready to jump uh, on the ticket. So uh, what do we see is uh, as, as a lawyers who are mostly representing investors is that the startup is, uh, the startups are entitled or they, uh, that, uh, they can uh, dictate the terms of the contracts more they, they could have, uh, for, let's say four or five years ago. Yeah, yeah back to the spreadsheet you mentioned that uh actually last year according to this spreadsheet there was uh, 156 investments with the average value of 1 billion euro mm. and this year so far we have like one three billion euros investment in total but the number of investment is uh, getting lower it's like 90 investment so we are getting uh the higher amount of money invested but fewer investment, which means there are fewer uh, startups. Funded. Exactly, and that, that's why everyone is talking about uh, some so-called smart money. Uh, uh, smart money is a term for some kind of additional value of the investor. Okay, the investor was bringing was bringing the investor to the table. He's bringing cash, and also uh, in 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 the recent days, uh, you want something more from uh, from the investor. Uh, and uh, interesting thing, uh, I have attended a conference, uh, investment conference in Budapest, uh, which was organized by uh, Hungarian Chink Venture Capital uh, Association. I in attended that, I don't know, of two, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I learned a really interesting point. There was, there was some kind of research, I think it was done on the US market, and uh, it was comparing uh, the feelings of the startups and the investors of, the, of, of what they think the, uh, of the additional value they are bringing to the table. And 90% of, of the investors thought, okay, this is smart money. We are bringing cash and also the, some kind of mentoring and we are bringing to your contacts, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, almost 90% of the startups thought, okay, the investor, it's cash, and then more or less a burden for us. So that, that's a really interesting point. What do, what do you think about this comparison? And show? Uh, how do you, do you find yourself it? as an added value? <laughs> <laughs> so, I have a clear opinion about this. Uh, this. The smart founder 
should see the investors as a partner. And as a partner, the founder uh, is empowered to request help in case this is needed. And uh, again, the smart founder is the one that is able to let the investor exert this help. So it's not only about like structured things like could be a mentoring program or some uh, business development help, but the role of the investors is the one of uh, uh, mentoring the startup in the first phases, setting up things for the next stages and opening doors. Now, is the door opening um, capability that the investor with the background, with the businesses that they have behind, with the businesses of the LPs that could be a synergy for the business can be used to be a, a door opening capability for the founders because it could help for a, a strategic partnership. It could help for a, finding the right distribution channel. It could help for uh, finding the right clients to start with and pilot a solution. So this is what the investor usually does. Uh, and it's in the hands of the founder to make sure that the right investor with the right capability is selected. Yeah. Uh, in our specific case, and the most of the, the, the most of the cases, the startup are happy to have us on the cap table uh, because we can provide governance on the artificial intelligence. Because we are industry agnostic, but we specialize in artificial intelligence. Mm. So if they are looking for specific guidance with experience that uh, risks and uh, obstacles can be quickly sorted by having this experience in the artificial intelligence field, of a business with startups at this stage, we would be a good fit for them. Uh, we usually co-invest. And what I might say myself to them, to the, to the founders, is that at the next stage, you know, what they need to look for is not another investor like we are, no. but it's an industry uh, related specific investor. Now, because uh, in the next stages, uh, it becomes even more important to have uh, the door opening capability in the specific sector industry they are looking for. So whatever is at this stage, it can be combined. In the US, they say dollars are green uh, in any mm -hmm. case. <laughs> but they think that uh, moving to Series A, uh, it becomes even more important to have the right investors on the cap table, because this is what often makes the difference uh, of, a, of a startup success and a, and, a, and a startup that will make it through somehow, but not that successful. Yeah. And real quick, you mentioned another trend that we have been noticing uh, in the Czech market. Uh, the trend of co-investment, because well, uh, in the in the recent years again, uh, we see uh, more and more co-investments being executed on the Czech market. And uh, well, from my perspective, uh, an additional value of a so-called lead investor and the other investors is that on the Czech, for example, on the Czech market, as I said, the investors they aren't that many; they all they all know each other. So. Is that the advantage for the investor that uh, he can uh, that it can rely on uh, on the due diligence and on the negotiations of the contract mm -hmm. of the other investor? Is that is that a good thing or uh, how much can you rely? How much how much do you do do you do your own homework and how much do you rely on on the on the lead investor? So I will answer this question with an with a with a side topic. Yeah. Know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because what what leads the decision of an investor to co-invest and not to lead? is the generic type of approach that the investor has. Mm. If you are not an expert in any specific field, you, know, you cannot act in a, as a lead investor in the most of the cases. Because as I said before, yeah. and I'm connecting this point with the previous one I made, uh, the startup is looking for an investor that can be a door opening, a door opener in a specific sector. And if you don't have the capabilities in the specific sector, you cannot be seen as a lead for the startup in the most of the cases. So acting as a co-investor, opening door for you to be a generic investor in terms of industries. You can be industry agnostic you know, and co-invest. So this is the first point and the first strategic reason that why investors mm -hmm. are co-investing. You know? This happens when there is a generic focus of the investment fund. Um, on the other hand, uh, of course, it's easier uh, because uh, um, usually the legal part is something that the lead investor take care of, pay for, and uh, and uh, is the the investor the lead the co investor is just tagging along. Uh, in terms of due diligence on the valuation, is this is something else that is, that is also easier for the co investor because usually it's done by the lead investor. I think though that an educated and uh, um, you know thorough investment fund or investors in general should also double check whatever is done by others. 
uh, because this serve to keep the market uh, at the at the at the right level of, uh, of of control, let's say. Um, because there may be many other reasons why the valuation is set up uh, in a different way. So usually investors also uh, double check their investment thesis uh, you know, yeah. and check check why are investing in the company and what is the vision that they have for a future exit, which in turn means what could be the valuation, the future valuation of the company. So I think it's a combination of all those factors. Uh, thank you very much for such for such exhaustive response. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 think, think about yeah I think we, we could discuss it for yeah, yeah, yeah. lots of hours. But but just, yeah, some... to, to sum it up, I think that the trends are uh, there are a lot of cash in the market, uh, good startup, not, not so many as uh, many years ago. And this leads to the fact that the founders or startup have having the better negotiation position. Exactly. And that reflects in lots of legal ways and it reflects how the convertible loan agreements are getting structured. And to to, to simplify, they're getting a lot of short term and it was this too. Absolutely. And final recommendation to uh, all, all the founders out there, well, uh, in the chip market, don't jump jump into bed with yeah. the first investor. Just do your do your homework as well. Do your homework as well because yeah, essential. We, yeah, we, we understand that the founders are also uh, getting bored with lawyers and numbers and stuff yeah, yeah. like that, and they want to have the uh, investor ready and focus on the on the product. But don't do that. Okay. Fair enough. I think that sums it up. Sums it up. But, uh, to, the, it was a really exhaustive response to the question. Uh, the the public <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Joseph, I'd, I'd like to, to turn to you. You've, the three of you have been talking about how the Czech Republic is generally very welcoming to investors. Uh, Joseph, what do you see as the biggest advantages or disadvantages to entering the Czech market or investors? Yeah, I, th I think it, it said that the Czech Republic is a very regional champion of this respect uh, for the for foreign direct investment because I think it's for the uh, for the study, uh, for the infrastructure for the geographic position for stuff like highly skilled work force and stuff like that. I think that uh, from the macroeconomic perspective, the Czech Republic is good and also is getting better. Right, yeah. you, you agree, Andrew, right? Uh, absolutely, 100%. I, 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 I think you prove, <laughs> you are the living proof of that. <laughs> and also from our narrow legal perspective, I think it's also getting better. I think that Czech Republic is uh, or its law system regarding contract law and corporate law is very flexible, which is much needed in the VC investment. Basically, you can agree whatever you want, unless we are selling children or stuff like that. And also it's uh, getting better in terms of case law, in terms of thinking of respective authorities that nowadays, like everything is permitted and you have to be adult enough to know what you are signed for. Yeah, exactly. And circling back to the uh, to the conference at the Budapest, uh, as I understand, as I underst understood it from the conference, there is a special regulation uh, in Hungary that you are not allowed to provide, for example, convertible loan agreements uh, or on a regular basis as an entrepreneur, it, which was really surprising for me, which really complicates the situation on the Hungarian market for angels. Uh, basically, if you are providing more than one, one uh, convertible note, a convertible loan in, in a year, you are supposed to be licensed and you need to be. Uh, in comparison to Czech Republic, we have no such regulation the, uh, for providing credits. Uh, we have only, we are only regulated with respect to uh, providing consumer credits. There is only regulation. So there is no regulation uh, as concerns providing the credit. Yeah, the so other if, thing if, is- if, yeah, if you want a lottery or something and you start to invest, you don't need any special license, you need only general- Or not a lottery, for example, an exit, successful exit is a start, uh, uh, <laughs> your successful exit, and you want to you want to uh, get the get the money back in the market. So that's that's allowed. What is not allowed, and Yosef, uh, Yosef will uh, fill in for me, is basically if you are raising money from the investors. If you are raising, uh, it's, it's not that it's not allowed, but uh, here is something, uh, or this is this is the area where you should be careful because the, it, it could be regulated. Like, uh, EU harmonized regulation of 
Exactly. Banks and stuff like that. So yeah, raising money, you should be careful with that. But uh, investing your own money, there is no special regulation. Uh, and also there are no special regulation with respect to the uh, uh, um, interest rates and stuff like that. And also it's very easy in Czech Republic to establish a limited liability company, which also is compared to the Germany or Austria, which yeah. takes months. So I think that's Czech Republic is very investor friendly. I would say so, yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Otto, I'd like to follow on from what Joseph was saying. I'm aware that uh, the two of you on behalf of KSB are involved in a project that brings together lawyers from top Czech law firms to focus on preparation of template documentation for pre-seed rounds. Could you tell our audience a little bit about that? It, it sounds like an, an interesting example of lawyer cooperation. Yeah, uh, thank you. That, that that's excellent example of lawyer cooperation. And additionally, it's excellent excellent example of how Czech Republic is getting better and more welcoming to the investors. Uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, it's a great initiative, and we have been inspired by the ones like USA, UK, Estonia, Israel, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, where the model or template documentation for seed and pre-seed rounds is uh, is or has been already implemented a couple of years ago uh, in the US and maybe a couple of decades ago. And I think that's uh, really great. And what is really good about this initiative is, as you, as you mentioned, it, it has brought together a number of firms. I think it's more than 20 if, I, if, I'm, not, if I'm not wrong. And uh, the good thing about that is it's not only the top Top uh, law firms in the, in the Czech market, such uh, such as ourselves. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to mention the others, but also the boutique, also the boutique for firms. Yeah, and I, the, I think we can mention it. like because it's also exam, a great example of how the legal market is changing. Because a few years ago there were a few specialized boutique law firms that uh, they were doing uh, this VC investments, uh, but now. Even the biggest law firm, like Allen and Overy and Square Patton and yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Patton are are doing the same thing as we yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. And uh, me particularly, me uh, me and Yusuf both actually, we have joined the team that is uh, that's focusing on the convertible loan agreement preparation. So it's really interesting, and it's uh, much to looking forward to. Uh, looking forward, we are. We are uh, doing our, our best to finish the project by the end of this year. So hopefully, hopefully from the next year, uh, the next year, the documentation will, will be simplified. And what is really good about that is, uh, yeah, we have managed to get to the table, the law firms representing more, more investors and the founders as well. So what we are trying to do, and everyone has open mind uh, in there, I really appreciate that. Uh, and what we are trying to do is do a balanced documentation. Trying, we are trying to do, do, do the basics. And okay, if you are the investor or the founder that wants some specific, you are welcome. You will always need lawyers to check and to add some stuff that is specific to your startup. Uh, but this should be a good, uh, a good uh, starting ground for you. And it should simplify the process because as we mentioned before, uh, it's not it's not a standard M&A area. You are you have no uh, three to six months uh, to wait for the cash. You need the cash to, uh, right away because you have the team and you have to pay the team. For example, IT startups, you have your IT guys and uh, you you have money for salary for salaries for I don't know Fortnite or something like that. What about you, Angelo? Uh, what do you think about this uh, this uh, uh, initiative? Yeah, do you think it would simplify the process? Uh, you know the. the there's one negative thing about this project, and that's it has no name. Yeah, it has no name. It's like association of law firms that are creating the templates, documents for VC. I think we should come up with some. Uh, that's something really we will do. Yeah, that's something what we will do. But anyway, it was something I knew even without you guys telling me <laughs> months ago. So it's something that is spreading somehow. So I think it's reaching even without the name. Other a name will probably help. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like a lot of investors are asking, like, are you, are, you have something, but it, it takes time. 
So to answer your question on that, if this is a good, uh, if I have a good impression of this project, um, I can say definitely yes. Um, there are three main things that happens in the moment of negotiation uh, mm -hmm. of a contract uh, from an investor uh, and a startup. Uh, trust is built or destroyed. Um, speed is very important, as you said, and uh, security protection from both ends is what is looked for. Yeah. Uh, I see this helping this standardization and creation of a framework where founders and investors have a preset of agreed terms that well understand can help for both for all the three parts that I described. Starting from trust, this is the most important thing, the most yeah. critical thing, I think. Because at uh, the moment of negotiating the conditions on and the very edge of the contract will also be a deal breaker. Mm. You can build the trust there or you can destroy the entirety. So sometimes this is also a moment of a deal breaking. Um, and making the founders bring in the clarity and uh, from both sides and why things are this way for the founders and why things should be this way for the investors with a level of transparency, with a higher level of transparency, I think is very crucial. So this project, I think it helps a lot building the trust between the two parts. To interrupt you, would, do, do you believe that this is some kind of additional value of a good lawyer in the venture capital if he's kind of able to read the room and feel how the relationship between the investor and the startup works? Definitely, definitely. I think good lawyers have uh, the inner capability of understanding, reading the situation and setting up, also using the right words to do not create an issue, right? Yeah. That, that's very crucial. <laughs> Sometimes it's not about the knowledge itself, but how you are a good moderator of the negotiation discussions. Yeah. The lawyer is not right. only, uh, with, together with the founders, is not only the legal expert, is also the legal moderator mm. <laughs> of the discussion, which uh, it's what it makes a good lawyer and a bad lawyer, in my opinion, in this specific space. Speed is definitely the other point, because having clarity, again, and transparency helps setting up things quickly which is very important in every day, in the, whatever business, but especially for startups, which have a specific runaway that they need to work uh, between. And uh, the third part is the, the security, you know, because if things are well understood, uh, it's more probable the specific terms will be accepted by both parts because the trust is built. So in turn, the first trust part helps in setting up the condition properly for both sides. So I think it's a win-to-win -win situation. Well, okay, let's see. And it's up to us to finish the project. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Josef, I'd like to turn to you to follow on to something about that project. It, it seems to me uh, that perhaps one of the biggest challenges in creating the template documentation is unifying the so-called market standard. Uh, why is that so tricky? Yeah. Thank you for the question. I think that Angel, uh, hasn't say a market standard even, even once because the, the, you said that it's framework and I think the better term is called framework because I don't believe that lawyers should create a market standard because and that's something we saw in discussion with them other VC lawyers that even if you do VC only VC transaction you still see a very uh, low fracture of what's happening in the market. So you have a very narrow perspective of what is market standard. And we have several discussions when Ota is saying, yeah, I haven't seen something. And the other lawyers are saying, in each convertible law agreement, we see contractual penalty for stuff like that. So uh, each lawyer should lower their ego and and discuss what's uh, how to help the market at the best. And there are a lot of obstacles main, mainly in, defin in defining what's, what's a default, because I think that the template should provide, should be helpful, like in a way that you have as less as work with it as possible. So I don't know, it started with very uh, easy question, like what it's more usual to have one founder or more founders? <laughs> And it's different whether the convertible agreements have founders or founder, which is uh, very uh, very easy to solve, I think. 
I think we, we agree that uh, usually they are more founders, but they are quite uh, more complicated question. I think we stuck on two very complicated question regarding creating the blade. And just to, uh, to provide an introduction for that, uh, and I'm going to follow up on, yeah. on what Josef said when he said, okay, this initiative was joined by the top legal firms in Prague. Uh, that's really interesting because uh, as, uh, as we did, most of these lawyers start as uh, banking and finance or M&A lawyers, and they are trying to uh, to include concepts from M&A into these contracts. And it's it not always works. So it, it, it doesn't always work. What do you think, Joseph? It's... <laughs> yeah, if, uh, me and Ota, we, we talked to ourselves that the, our main goal in this initiative is push back the M&A concept to be like sneaking in, into this initiative. And the first example are reps and warranties because in our view and what we saw abroad, there should be very, very narrow because in uh, VC investment, I think you, you are you're buying a future, so there's nothing to, nothing to warrant or to wrap. The major but difference between m and and the VC is that in, uh, in M&A, uh, the founder is getting the money, he's exiting. In the VC, the company is getting the money. So you, can, you cannot expect the founder to secure you or to provide you with uh, 20, 20 or 30 pages of warranties with, and uh, to provide a personal guarantee uh, that they are true and correct. What do you think, Angelo? Is that, is that something that you would want founder to do? And how is that connected with the level of trust that you are trying to build with him? I think that the pushback that you guys are exerting in uh, not having uh, M&A specific terms into the uh, convertible loan agreement, because this is a, from what I understood what you guys are working yeah. on specifically, it's a, definitely a good thing. Yeah. Because uh, the two the two part are the two things are different, completely different animals, and they should be treated in a different way. Yeah, uh, um, in the most of the cases, uh, uh, as Ota said, you can put liabilities on the founders. The liabilities are on the company, yeah, which per se is a is a is a difference. And um, yeah, I think we're getting back to the recent development. Like uh, in US, you will have. Contract, uh, convertible loan agreement only with a company. A uh, few years back, here you have like with the uh, the contract with the company and all shareholders. Now you are getting only the founding shareholders, and I think we are getting to the point when there will be only the company. Uh, uh, only the company, because the perspective founder, uh, as I understand it, that they didn't want to sign a deal that had like 1 million euro in it. Even they are not legally speaking liable for returning on that, uh, they're not comfortable of signing something that, that, that says the company should return uh, yeah. 1 million euro to the, to the event because they, they want to have the opportunity if things uh, will not go well, which yeah. is from more probable scenario, yes. uh, to start a new project. They don't have to be burdened with debt for the rest of their lives. Exactly. And since we are focusing on the Czech Republic and the scene region, I think it's important to stress out uh, that there has to be a balance. There has to be a middle ground. And I understand uh, investors why they want that, because uh, just to bore you with some le uh, Czech legal stuff, basically, you are not able to do the conversion without the cooperation of the founders. So what we are trying to do uh, in the template documentation, for example, is to find the middle ground. OK, the founders should, be, should not be liable for the business. You are investing in the business, do your own due diligence. And if the business fails, uh, I'm not giving you a personal guarantee. You are not going to take my house, for example. But on the other hand, uh, you need some kind of commitment from the founders that they are going to convert you. And this is completely in their hands. So it's only fair to penalize, penalize them if they are not going to, uh, to do that. It's, uh, in these specific cases, sanctions, for, from my perspective, make sense. So that's why I am against, uh, against having only the company, the, a party to the contract. But as I said, it's about finding them in the ground. Um, if I may, yeah. uh, I believe that the whole exercise should start with addressing the principles of the usual negotiations. Yeah. Uh, going back to the principles is always a good thing because it what is what lets you recognize uh, what is the 20% of the terms that makes for the 80% of the principles. Mm -hmm. 
and you focus using Pareto law because uh, otherwise you will have a 60 pages contract, which with the 80% of the terms, there are something that is not helping anybody. It's just there to be look solid and uh, legally great, but in reality, it, yeah. there's not much. I think that MNLs are usually very risk averse, but in the VC, it's, it's venture, it's, it's adventure, it's very, Risk very is risky. Risk the business itself. <laughs> yeah. You know. So yeah, I think that good lawyer in VC investment should understand that it's risk business and should know the important things. Okay. And and in, in this respect, so we are trying to have uh, like conversion formula, uh, which is the same in each cases, a perfect one. But the others, so the, the reps and warranties, I think that they, it's, we see, we see, we see lawyers have clear opinion on that. MNA lawyers are trying to push something which doesn't belong there, okay. But I think, Otta, can you describe the other thing we discussed, which even VC lawyers haven't agreed upon? Yep. That's, and I will be actually looking forward to hearing Angel's opinions on that from the, from the business perspective. What we have been discussing, and it's really specific uh, for the convertible loans. As, as we said, the convertible loans, it's not a legal instrument in the Czech Republic. It's a contract. Uh, it's uh, not a specific type of contract, for example, as a purchase agreement. Yeah. So we are all trying, and as Joseph already mentioned, there is no case law. We do not have any literature. We have not any commentaries. We, have, we do not have any case law. So we are still uh, finding what is right and what is wrong. Yeah. And we all uh, have to, we, we need to connect it all to some legal institutes uh, under the Czech law. And what is really interesting is uh, you are familiar with obligatory conversion upon uh, upon qualified financing. Okay, the new investor comes to the company and the previous uh, convertible loan investors are obliged to convert themselves. They have not the option of repayment. Yeah, and uh, we've been discussing, okay, what well, the investor does nothing. He is not cooperating and he's, he, he wants the money and he is not willing to convert himself. And there was the dis this dispute between the lawyers uh, in, in, the, yeah, in the group. Our, our position was that when the investor should convert, it cannot mean that if he will do nothing, he's still entitled to get his money back. Because in such case, he doesn't have to convert if the end game is he's getting money back. So we, uh, we argue that in such case, the investor should forfeit in investment. Like if exactly. The ultimate question is, you do not cooperate and you are obliged to convert and you do not cooperate, are you still entitled to get your money back or not? What, what, what would you think from a uh, from commercial perspective? So I, I think it's a matter of clarity since the very start in setting up expectations, mm. maybe also what founders expect from, yeah. the, from the investor, right? You're talking about the investor fulfilling specific promises, but how those are reflected in the contract. Yeah, no, it's not about the promise. It's about the, when you are obliged to convert, you convert. Yeah. And if you do not, you not you are not getting your money back because it's uh, it's obligatory conversion. The conversion doesn't the question, work both ways. Yeah, because in, in the general, question you, you can you get shouldn't. your equity or your share yes. without do, doing signing paper and stuff like that. So yes. if you are passive, not responding to emails, calls, anything like, like six months, doing nothing. But actually, I wasn't really said this really yeah. good point. Why should if you have this if, if you set the terms in the beginning, right? Yeah. Uh, there is no reason for you not to convert. So uh, it's yeah. about setting the terms, I guess. Exactly. That's about the expectations because uh, what could be the scenario where the investors that has invested with specific terms at the beginning in two years' time after maturity date doesn't mm -hmm. want to convert? I think it's about the analysis of those scenarios. Why yeah. it doesn't want to convert? Yeah. And, and covering those specific scenarios, but those are specific things. We may think about them right now, but I think in general, whatever investors want automatic conversion, because this is why he invested in the first place. Yeah. So it was, it was very fruitful discussion because we are saying, like, also from the uh, startup perspective, uh, when they are doing qualified financing and once they will have to pay like 1 million euro to someone, they, do, they don't have this case, they only burn it. So it will be very burden for them. So yeah, our point was to clarify it in the template document. Yeah. And we have like two hours discussion about that and lots of different perspectives. Because yeah. the other point is, if we are providing investors with contract, it yes. says in some case, you are profiting your money, they will not accept it. And the template 
equipment will not be used. Yeah. Okay, but I think that sums it up to specifics of the of the uh, of the Czech market in this respect. Yeah, it, it's not easy, but nothing. Thanks very much. Um, Angelo, I'd like to move the conversation along to the issue of employee stock ownership plans. Um, it seems that this has sort of this concept has developed uh, in the, the Czech Republic to some extent recently. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the role of employee stock ownership plans and, and how it's perceived in VC investments in the Czech Republic? Good question. Um, so the so-called ESOP, Employees Stock Option Plan, it's a crucial tool for startups and investors. Uh, why? Uh, because it gives a tool to the startups to attract great employees uh, with the promise of uh, returns that are attached to the success of the company. So what it does is giving the employees a skin in the game. Hmm. You know? uh, the, when, uh, when this was established first, the, the principle behind the, the ESOP uh, was actually uh, giving uh, the opportunity to the employees that were critical hires for the company uh, to, to have a motivational part of uh, attached to their salaries. You know? uh, usually, uh, employees at an early stage of maturity even get paid a little bit less than a market standard, which would be established by the corporates. But what they get in return is the option to purchase shares at a specific market price, which is uh, valuable in case the valuation of the company grows. So try to imagine that if I'm joining a startup today and I get to and I get offered a specific salary, I get offered also a, a, an ESOP plan. Now, and try to imagine that uh, um, I'm offered with this ESOP plan, but I'm not being offered shares directly in the company. I may offer the promise of uh, a purchase of shares at a discounted price that I can convert in the future into shares. At the moment that those shares can be sold, yeah? uh, so that I don't have the burden of the tax liabilities because I, I am not a shareholder as an employee, but I'm getting the promise of earnings upon sales of those of those shares. So what happened is that uh, the option is attached to what is called strike price, uh, which is the uh, usually uh, the the share price that is calculated attached to the market fair price of the company at the moment I would join the startup. And if I will contribute well, my team will contribute well, and the company valuation is gonna be growing because the, all the objectives are met, then there is a delta between the strike price and the new market fair price per share. And if an exit occur, I can make a sell of, the, of those shares that I will get in the future. Um, and um, at that moment, I will have uh, my payback for the efforts that I've exerted. Yeah, it, it worked as long as the valuation is getting higher. So, as, much, as we discussed, indeed, the valuation also <laughs> could get lower. And in such case, it's venture. It's, it's <laughs> venture even for employees. Uh, that's it. No, yeah. I, I think the employees should choose like the company they believe in and uh, the company that they can <laughs> exert the most of the value, because uh, it's a it's a it's a sort of investment they do themselves as investors do. So uh, it, it's a tool anyway that is very important for startups to make the good hire at the beginning. And I think the startups at every stage of maturity should think about having an ESOP allocated sooner rather than later. Yeah. yeah? Because it's helping uh, at the beginning, mm -hmm. the only thing that makes again Pareto law, the the eighty percent of the results with the twenty percent of the effort is the team. So if you don't take care of your team pro properly at the beginning, yeah, yeah, you decrease your chance for success. And SOP is the tool that allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, attached to that, and maybe guys, you will talk a little bit more about this, uh, is the vesting plan. Yeah, mm. because the access of allocation is the promise of a specific bucket yeah. of shares you will get in the future. Uh, at the moment, you can sell those. Uh, but there is also a vesting plan yeah, uh, that is offered to the employees in order to get those options, percentages. Yeah? Yeah. 
And usually you have the scheme that is a, a one year cliff and four year cliff. It means that if you are offered the, uh, an X percentage of, uh, of uh, shares option, um, you get, uh, don't know, 25% in the first year and the rest at the end of the another four year period. This is kind of standard, but usually uh, uh, this is the some, something that happened. Of course, there are many different type of uh, vesting schemes. Uh, I've seen many myself. But another rule of thumb that I can uh, I can talk about here is that usually 10% um, of the ESOP is got by the first 10 employees. Mm -hmm. The other 10% of the ESOP is got by the second. Uh, the, five, the, the another five percent. Sorry, so it's ten. The first ten. Another five percent is got by the new ten employees who come later, and the, another five percent is got by the latest fifty employees mm -hmm. that are joining the company. So it's ten to the first ten, five to the second ten, and five to the second fifty. This is a, as a rule of thumb. Yeah which in turn means that the average allocated to the ASO is 20%. Yeah. Makes sense to reward people for loyalty, I guess, huh? Yes. And it could be as low as 5%, as big as 25% usually. But a good average is 15 to 20. And the allocation of the percentage depends on the type of buyers that you have to make. Because try to imagine, if you need a lot of back office workers, you know, mm. doesn't make much sense to reward back office positions with the with ESOP, because it may not be critical for the business. But when you make specific hires that work on a strategic yeah. level, technical people, uh, sales people, then really make, uh, really have a huge skin in the game of the success of the company, those people need to get rewarded properly uh, so that they are uh, motivated to do the maximum for the success of the company. So I, I, I did a little bit of a long excursus, but I hope no, it was clear. No. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yosef, I'd like to ask you from the legal point of view, uh, what are the possible variations for how to set up an ESOP plan? And, and what are the pros and cons, for example, tax impacts, or do we expect any changes in legislation on this point? As you can see, when you ask a uh, business guy about ESOP, they can speak for hours how, how it's going on <laughs> business legal version. But from legal perspective, when you say ESOP, it's not even clear what it means because <laughs> it's not clear whether it's abbreviation of employee stock option plan or employee stock ownership plan. Yes. And exactly. it starts also with it starts with abbreviation and it's not getting better because. It doesn't mean anything, and it also can mean a lot of different type of uh, things. First division is between actual shares and and virtual virtual shares. Uh, the first one, the actual uh, giving the employees share in the company or option to buy an actual share, it isn't very much used because as we are saying very often, once you are giving someone uh, equity in Czech uh, limited liability company, you cannot get rid of it unilaterally, like they have to agree to exit yeah, the yeah. company. So mm -hmm. it's, to it's totally not... correct. They, they can complicate your life like with 1% uh, or 0.1%. Yeah. It's really, really complicated. And, and, and it's actually you don't want like, to have like even 10 shareholders in the limited liability company. Exactly. But as Angelo mentioned, uh, the the purpose of the employee stock option plan is to reward them on the exit or uh, give them some earnings to the company. Mm -hmm. It's not to uh, give them uh, give them share on the decision making of the company. It's not their interest and yeah. it's definitely not your interest. So that's not how it should work. So that's why virtual shares are. But is it, that's not only the only reason in the Czech Republic why do, why do we use virtual shares? Is that? Yeah, I think it's. <laughs> no, I think the virtual shares are used. And also, like, uh, there's a big difference who is paying who because mm. in case of virtual shares, the company is uh, is paying the money to the to the employee. And in fact, it's only a more complicated way how to re remunerate people. That's only like uh, wages with complicated formulas. 
It is, but what it does for investors and founders is giving a skin in the game yeah. uh, to the employees. I think like economies are clear, like motivate and attract it's, it's top, it. top skill, top skill yeah. to employees, but yeah. it's the motivating intrinsic value that the, that the virtual shares have for the employees because they feel part of the company and they are part of the company because their effort can translate in money for them too. But, uh, yeah, but legal, it's only uh, like amendments to the, to the employee contract. It's, right. it's, n- it's not, uh, it's not uh, nothing more beneficial, right? So, uh, yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's uh, as Angelo said, it's about the feeling. When, yeah. when when you feel that you uh, you can participate uh, on the proceeds of the company from the yeah. exit from or otherwise, I think you are more motivated to uh, yes. to have the company grow. Yes. Then of course, as you Joseph yeah. said, it depends if it's an option employee stock option plan yeah. or is employees uh, stock ownership yeah. plan. Because in this case, you give the uh, the employees uh, a, a tax liability. This are tax implication when you are a share owner and not only. Yeah? Uh, so yeah, it, it, in, in that case, it's a little bit more complicated because also what happened is that, as you say, the, the valuation goes down. Yeah? You not only <laughs> lose the, you lose what the, the, the effort that you have exerted in the company, but, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, and second thing is the taxation, as you mentioned. In most countries, as well, have like special treatment with regard to the taxation. In Czech Republic, all is subject to the employee taxation, which is like 44%. Yeah, that, that's so. so uh, We've been hearing some news from the markets that yeah. there are some initiatives, there is some kind of lobby on, on the Czech legislature yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to amend yeah. this, but it's not probably it's not happening any anytime near anytime in the near future because well it's like the the elections election was one year ago and uh, if, uh, uh, taking into account the current crisis etc etc inflation etc there is really not uh, not not much motivation to to lower taxes basically yeah we heard that there were some initiatives to go to the legislators to lower the tax burden on ESO and uh, like last one was that. And I would, <laughs> different thing to throw out now. Yeah, and just to clarify this for me and for the audience yeah. too, are we talking about ownership right now, not option plan, right? But, 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 but basically, the tax, the, tax, uh, the, uh, the proceeds from the company that you receive, they are always subject to taxation, as Joseph yes. said, uh, and it doesn't really matter if you are owner of the share or not. That's why ESOP is really not. With, in respect of ESOP, the Czech Republic is really sort of sort of slow. We should we should get quicker and uh, implement implement what is trendy in other Western countries. Yeah, rule of thumb. Or if, of if you are getting money because you are employee, it's subject to employee taxation. Okay. And no matter how you get there, whether it's option or very uh, complicated formula in the contract, when you get the money from the company because you are employee, it's it's subject to employee taxation. It's quite hard. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. So yeah, to sum it up, don't say ESOP. Do a little more. Explain what, what you mean by that. Because in convertible loan agreements, it has many implications with respect to conversion because it's it's going into the on agility basis formula. It's very important with respect to dilution and, and stuff like that. That's by acronyms. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you very much. Okay, Otta, I'd like to turn back to you. We've spoken now about how to motivate the employees in an early stage company, but what about the founders founders themselves? How does an investor make sure it keeps the founders focused and motivated, but at the same time, not limiting them too much? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question again, Sasha. Mm. And I'm just going to follow up, follow up on what Angelo said. It's about it's always about the level of trust. Uh, the founder is usually already motivated because he has the majority share in the company, so he he really wants the company to succeed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, here comes uh, the motivation of the investor or the interest of the invest, investor to basically secure that the founder stays motivated and that he's not going to run away and steal the, uh, steal, steal the product. Uh, etc etc so basically in the uh, in the in the agreements that we are usually uh, usually coming across uh, we use uh, three kind of provisions uh, to secure the founder and to motivate him to stay with the, with the company 
Uh, basically, we are talking about non-compete obligation. We are talking about full commitment and we are talking about non-solicitation. And what is interesting that each of those has uh, some legal implications which are not really, which we are really not fond of. I'm, I'm going to start with non-compete clause. Uh, non-compete uh, non clause basically means that you cannot join a competitive company. Uh, this, is, this is already incorporated in the Czech law if you are, or, uh, if you are already an executive on that company. Uh, but still, it's, uh, we, really, we would really recommend uh, implementing this into the contract. What is really, uh, from the commercial point of view, and uh, I will ask Angel uh, for more detail, what is for us as lawyers, what we always stress out is, okay, uh, we cannot say any competitive activity. We must define the competitive business. Yes. And the difference here is, okay, if I'm a founder, for example, at Uber, let's talk about your Uber back, uh, back, uh, back in the day when they were startup. Okay, you want to, uh, the competitive business for you is any kind of software or uh, and car, about car sharing. When you are an investor, you are talking about any software development. Yes. And it's really hard to find the middle ground and not to ruin trust, as, as you mentioned, Anjo, isn't that, isn't that so? Yeah, that's correct. Guys, as you know, because we have been working on different deals together, um, uh, practically some of those terms in reality work as a test between the founders and investor. Uh, and this is exactly one of those cases. Yeah, yeah. Excellent With point. The, the, the acceptance of, uh, of uh, those conditions demonstrate trust and, uh, and motivation within the founding team to the investor. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's something that is protected by the labor law in the Czech Republic specifically. So there is already a liability for the founders to respect this, but accepting this, this let's say uh, additional per se, uh, uh, term attached to the investment contract is a, is a proof that this motivation is present and there is no fraudulent behavior uh, that the founder would potentially uh, have. So it's a it's a confirmation of uh, trust. I, I this is how I see it. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, well, from a, what do you think? Uh, what strictly from a legal perspective, there is an under, another issue with the non-compete clauses because, well, in, in the Czech civil code, we have the limitation then uh, that you can agree on a non-compete clause uh, for for no more than five years. And it's like it's, it's been open to interpretation. Yeah. But uh, as far as we are aware, uh, as far as we are aware, this uh, this provision was inspired by the Italian civil code called Civil 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 Yeah, Codice Civil. Perfect. <laughs> That's great to have an Italian on board here. <laughs> and uh, based on their case law, it doesn't mean that it's only five years because most of startups they are living organisms. You need uh, you need to. Uh, to bind the founder and limit the founder for the years that he's actually participating in the company and for some time after. And for example, if the exit is going to be in seven years, you just need to five plus two. And as, as, as far as we are aware, the, the Italian case law has accepted this approach. So hopefully this, uh, this, will, be, this will be the decisions of the Czech courts as well. Yeah, yeah, what you are saying, it makes perfect sense to me. But then the competition lawyer, <laughs> yeah. welcome because as you can see, we may not be very fond of M&A lawyers. It's mainly the, Re the regulation is better, but, but, I guess. <laughs> but uh, what we really hate are competition lawyers be because they, they uh, we've been told that, for example, like non-competition clause cannot be longer than three years, right? And uh, which is the most absurd is that. Uh, now they are saying that you cannot agree on a non-solicitation clause because it's mm -hmm. limiting competition. Because right. it's limiting competition, and we we went to the deeps of this case, and it all started in 2006 mm -hmm. when Apple, Google, Adobe, and Pixar uh, agreed that they are not soliciting uh, mm -hmm. other employees. Mm -hmm. It's really like it makes perfect sense to me to, to uh, ban this uh, as an antitrust clause mm -hmm. or antitrust. Agreement. But what competition laws are making is saying, okay, make let's make it general. You cannot agree on a non solicitation. Yeah, that, that is the problem. You are actually applying uh, the, the rules uh, that you've uh, 
that that you have detached from uh, from Google and yeah. Apple uh, Apple companies, and you are applying them to to startups which are just starting in the Czech Republic. So that's that's really and not a fortunate limit. solution. <laughs> no startup will limit any competition. Yeah. So again, again, guys, two different animals. So yeah. you cannot treat them the same. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think a great point was made uh, from, uh, but this is what did you said before, Ota, uh, regarding the the. Um, the non compete clause mm -hmm. works perfectly for me for investors. Yeah, the, the, the you know the similarities to the Italian uh, code that you that you mentioned. But what about funders? Yeah? Funders always come with the uh, uh, with the um, argument <clears throat> that what happens if uh, in uh, three years the company fail, the startup mm -hmm. fail? My expertise is very very domain oriented. I am a subject matter expert of uh, Telco. Yeah. So I will end up working in Telco, bringing the experience and the knowledge that I measured yeah. in this startup into the Telco company. Oh, well, I'm not allowed to work in the field yeah. where I matured my expertise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's perfectly right. They are 100% right. So how do you guys solve this? <laughs> yeah. uh, you need to understand there are extreme cases. Like uh, on the one hand, the product is not successful. It's not blame on the founder, yeah. simply uh, the Matt will do this thing and he needs to do another business. And on the other hand, we have like another extreme scenario that he's taking your money and yes. stealing and, and establishing and another there. company without you and yes. like stealing you from your investments. And <clears throat> these extreme cases, they have a very great area between. And uh, for lawyers, it's very hard uh, Unfortunately, uh, to, to name it at the uh, we just basically every clause or every provision in the contract can be misused yeah, for yes. uh, by one party or the uh, another. And for lawyers, it's a very it's very hard to find wording that would fit all the situations. So that's and it actually brings me to another point that basically uh, these clauses should limit founders, and the founders are bringing these arguments. And I think why uh, why these clauses are such sensitive topic is. Basically, they are always secured by contractual benefit. And why is that? Basically, uh, if you are breaching non-compete clause, where is the damage? Basically, yeah. what is the amount of damage? And it's it's almost impossible, or it's really very very hard, and it's expensive to determine the amount of knowledge, uh, knowledge <laughs> damage incurred by the investor. That's why we always use contractual penalties. And as as we have been discussing uh, before, these are always sensitive within a contract. Uh, uh, in respect of or, or in the area of the venture capital. What is actually great, and I would like to hear your opinion about that, is that in the recent years we have been we have been uh, witnessing the trend of uh, reverse vesting. Basically, it's some some kind of middle ground. There is there will be no uh, contractual penalty, but if you are breaching those rules, basically you will transfer a certain portion of your share, which is not already vested because, again, we must, uh, we need to reward your loyalty, but you will be transferring uh, a part of your share to the investors. How, how do you perceive, and basically how is this perceived from the from the founder side? Is that something you, or from these options, what, what is your preference? I don't know how this will uh, properly apply to the venture business in early stage. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, and I will answer the the, the, the question uh, with a uh, with a little bit longer discussion, yeah. But I think it's very important. And uh, Sasha, I will minding the time. <laughs> you, you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead, Angelo. <laughs> Here I go. Uh, so investors invest in the team first. The business without the team is nothing. You invest in the founders. This is why we say the important thing is the trust, mainly. Yeah. That's right. Oh, Another rule of thumb that investors have is that a company to be eligible to reach Series A must have a funding team that is holding at least 50 plus percent of ownership in the company. Mm. Investors do this because this is what keeps founders motivated to walk the yeah. walk mm. to the exit. Yeah. So if you do a penalization on uh, Taking away <clears throat> shares from the founders, you demotivate them. So this is something that I wouldn't do, that I would discourage people mm -hmm. to do, because it's destroying the funding team motivation, where the funding motivation is everything. Yeah. This is my personal standpoint. 
So I'm not a fan of this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's actually that's actually a good point. Uh, well, uh, what, what do you want more? If basically I I don't think that you have experienced many cases where where you have been actually exercising the right to contractual penalty. It's sort of a motivator as well. Exactly, it's a deterrent. Yeah. You know, it's a yeah. deterrent. And in terms, you if you take away shares, is a demotivator. So what happened? Let, let's look at the principle. <clears throat> if something is going wrong and there is the penalty. You put the penalty as, at, uh, against something that is already dying. Mm. Yeah. So it's not working. It's not this the goal. The goal is to work as a deterrent and build the trust at the beginning and giving the investor the, the trust again that the team is okay and comfortable with the terms because it's working not in a fraudulent way. In terms, if something goes wrong and you get shares from the founders to you as an investor, what are you really getting? If the investor is getting demotivated by this action and the business cannot perform as well as, the, as it should because the founder, the leader of the team is not motivated enough to make the success, the company a success, what are you really getting from an investor? Yeah, I, I what is the value of these shares? Breaking through and this lecture or discussion, uh, as you can see, it's very important to set a balance between securing your investment and Getting mm -hmm. the space for founders to do their thing, not uh, not to bind them too much. Yes, because in such case you are not getting your money back. Yes, uh, I think that I've experienced myself. Yeah. Just to close up the topic, uh, is that uh, investors from uh, uh, different countries, uh, U.S. especially, uh, have understood the. Um, the framework that is uh, easier and a little bit more flexible. Uh, than investors in Europe, which are mm. more, um, let's say, risk-oriented yeah. rather than uh, US investors. There are many reasons we can accept. We, I can agree with something, I can disagree with other things, but this is a, the, general, uh, the general trend. Yeah. And the general con conclusion would be, basically, yeah, we are drafting the contracts for 1% of cases where you actually need it. In most cases, you, you are getting along with the team, you are getting along with the founders, yeah. and you are you are growing together, but basically that is that one percent where you will need it, and uh, the, uh, the unfortunate thing is that you don't know which one. <laughs> Absolutely, but it's very valuable. Yeah, the whole the whole framework, legal framework, is a hundred percent very valuable in this. It's crucial to establish also clarity in the commercial terms. It's not just about protection; it's also about like uh, the commercial event, which could be. And unclear. Yeah, and it's yeah. also about the expectations. <clears throat> I think what what what, what, what is the edi additional uh, or added value of the lawyer is yes. like set the expectations because uh, I have witnessed many cases uh, where parties uh, read the same text and they thought Completely not the same thing at all. Completely different things. So <clears throat> that's the additional uh, value of, of, of the lawyer to find the wording, which is understandable for both parties. I, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Um, I would now like to turn to Q&A because we've had some very interesting questions come in uh, over the chat box. So I'll read out the question and then I'll, I'll let uh, in, any of you uh, answer it. We have a question from Robert and Robert says, do you think that the non-existence of an AI regulatory sandbox in the Czech Republic could be an entry barrier for further development of AI investments. That's, it is that's for you. That's, that's AI that's for me. Me. I, I guess. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Sasha, I, would you please repeat the question once again? Yes, because sure. Um, he says, uh, do you think that the non-existence of an AI regulatory sandbox in the Czech Republic could be an entry barrier for further AI investments? So let me answer to this question in this way. Um, I don't think it would be a barrier. Um, also because we are talking about something that is uh, yet being discussed. And uh, it's not clear how the evolution of the legislation is going to be set up in the future. So this is a live animal that is changing uh, week after week. And uh, I believe that we, the whole Europe will, be, will come into an agreement of a, of a legal framework that will enable technology uh, rather than, uh, than uh, 
penalize it. So I think that things are going to be set up uh, the right way uh, in this sense. Uh, I've been uh, listening to some discussion uh, to the European level. Um, then uh, the way we're going it seems to be promising rather than, uh, than negative. So I'm, I'm a fan of uh, believing uh, in a positive development. So I, I think this specific topic uh, will, be, will be probably fixed and uh, rather than uh, penalized. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Jane and Jane is asking, from which countries do we see the most VC investors coming into the Czech Republic? So what, from which countries are VC investors coming most into the Czech Republic? I, I guess the Czech, Czech Republic is, is an easy answer, uh, but uh, thinking about foreign countries, uh, I believe it still would be UK and US and Germany. Yeah, probably. What's your experience when you are investing in Joe uh, in the Czech Republic? It, it, it really depends. Uh, it really depends on the founding team, actually, because, uh, mm. you know, uh, the founding team, uh, the company is Czech, the founding team will be made by foreigners. Yeah. You know? And uh, this itself can bring, like, investors from the country where this person is from, because it's establishing a specific ecosystem. Uh, but uh, from what I've seen myself, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, German investors, there is uh, Hungarian investors, Polish investors, um, UK investors too. So those are um, some of the Swiss investors. Mm. So those are all some of the, the ones we have actually co-invested that I can tell yeah. myself that have uh, had that role in the specific stuff. Thank you. Uh, yeah, most of the investments are local. Yeah, not, not saying that the money are local, but uh, the, 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 the institutions industry. that invest here in the Czech Republic uh, they usually hire uh, local guys because they understand the market and they have they have all the connections needed for this business because this business is a lot about connections and meeting people, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Johan and Johan asks, are there any specific Czech sectors or industries where you see the most uh, venture capital investment? Yeah, uh, basically here we can refer to the uh, to, to the spreadsheet that we we, we have yeah. been talking about uh, earlier, where I believe there that there is uh, there is uh, there is many sectors and I think we are numbers of investments. E e-commerce. Yeah, e well, it's, it is e-commerce. It's generally IT and software development as well. And actually, basically, what I have been noticing, and also in our deals, food food industry is really growing. Basically, because well, we're uh, eating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're eating a lot, and uh, I'm I don't want to limit food industry only to the food, but also to food delivery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I've been noticing this trend that the, this is this is, this has been very popular nutrition in the recent years. Yeah. Sorry, nutrition supplements. Yeah, yeah nutrition supplements as well. So this 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 all I mean when I say food industry. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot agree more with this, guys. I've read also some uh, reports from local agencies. Uh -huh. And uh, e-commerce and JIT sectors in general, like uh, uh, is, the, is the one that gets the, the most investment, is also the one that invests the most in research and development. Yeah. yeah. So that was happening in the Czech Republic right now. Okay. And our final question from Sergio. Sergio asks about valuation. And he says, are there any key differences in the valuation process throughout Europe uh, CEE region in the Czech Republic, are there any specific factors for valuation in the Czech market? You are our expert for <laughs> determining valuation. <laughs> yes. So um, the, the only difference, so what, what happened? Why this question has been asked in the first place? I perfectly understand the reason why. Uh, US companies have higher valuation than uh, European companies. Uh, in turn, um, it, so the reason why, in reality, is that U.S. companies cost more than European companies. In terms of burn rate, a U.S. company will always have, in yeah. most of the cases, a higher burn rate than a European company in average. Yeah. So if you need to go with the rule of thumb that I described before, to a series A with the funding team having at least the 50% of ownership, what is that you need to raise up? Yeah. The valuation of the company, 
Otherwise, if you use a valuation of company is lower, you will end up giving more than what you should mm. as a funding team. Hence, the valuation will increase, mathematically speaking. Yeah. Um, now, the, the how the valuation is defined uh, is the crucial part. Because uh, this mechanism that I just described, it's not what the investors should use or what the funders should see as the as the as the valuation uh, uh, as a criteria for the valuation of the company. The valuation of the company should be based on the amount of revenue that the company should make and the indicators from the market about what is the uh, potential exit valuation that this company may have and how the valuation will evolve among the various investment rounds. And usually what is used is the company valuation post money divided by the annual recurrent revenue. Uh, you may have also other indicators. You can use uh, recurrent annual recurrent revenue. You can use a EBITDA multiplier, uh, but no matter which one do you use, you can use other also specific things, but no matter which kind of parameter do you use, you should always create a connection between what is the revenue projection of the company, the profitability of the company, and what other similar company has been experienced in the past, because what is driving the whole calculation is the exit at the end. So it's a little bit of a retro engineering work starting from there and rationalize the process using uh, uh, market parameters, multipliers, and uh, revenue projections. And uh, I wanna have a, 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 an ask for all the founders listening to us, make sure that when you build your financial projection, you include the whole path from funding, from foundation of the company, ending up with the exit. Yeah? You will facilitate the life of the investors. You will make a better impression on the investors and you will have clear plans. Because if you have the wall, the wall of financial projection up until the exit, it means that you are clear with a roadmap. It means that you are clear with your business model and pricing model. And it means that you have a focus that is specified in that roadmap. So try to make sure that you work would you work at that through and uh, and everybody will be super happy about seeing those data. And, and Angel, how would you do uh, reverse engineering in emerging markets where there are no leading examples of exits? Uh, I'm not an expert myself yeah. of, of uh, merging acquisition, yeah. so I don't feel comfortable yeah. to, to 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 talk about that. But I guess that uh, yeah, those are treats a little bit. I know they are treated a little bit differently than, uh, than what I just discussed. Yeah. Mm. Because uh, in, uh, in the early stage of maturity level of a startup, uh, it's, uh, there is the ratio and there is the magic, we say. Uh, yeah. uh, and it's a little bit of combination uh, of the two things. So we use a lot of rule of thumbs and we use a, a lot of analytics based on the, on the valuation of the company. Also, uh, discounted cash flow can be used, but uh, it has some limitation and you need to make a lot of assumptions in order to make it work. So, Thank you very much, Angelo. Uh, now, before we wrap up, um, Otto, I just wanted to ask you, I understand that our law firm is holding an in-person seminar on venture capital in the next couple of weeks here in Prague. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, I would forget, forget about that. Uh, yeah, Joseph and I actually are actually organizing uh, a more... Uh, more Czech law oriented webinar, I believe it will be webinar next Tuesday, uh, which which will cover more of the legal specifics of, of the Czech legal framework, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you are interested, unfortunately, it's only in Czech, but if you're interested, just yeah. check our website and, and no, we'll less, be less, to less numbers, more law. Yeah, less numbers, more law. So Okay, so I, believe, I believe the yeah. details for that webinar are both on our KSB LinkedIn page and also on our website, www.ksb.cz. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I, th I think we could talk, talk for many hours. It's really been fascinating listening to you. Um, Nathan, uh, I will ha hand you back to Legal 500 headquarters. Thanks so much, Sasha. Um, 
I also want to thank uh, Oda, Yosef, and Angelo, uh, as well as Sasha for moderating. Uh, it's been a really illuminating experience. Uh, I had a really excellent time. Um, want to wish everyone all the best and have an excellent rest of your day.